All right. Well, I'm curious if anybody figured out this title before the, uh, the beginning of the talk. Anybody figure this out? I was guessing. <laughs> and no. your, guess what? your guess was what? North side of uh, Lake Huron. Yes, you're right. But anyway, we'll get into it. Uh, next slide, Barb. Uh, this is one of my favorite mine paintings or minor paintings. It's Tribute to the Miner by Dennis Gagnon, and that's the way he does spell his name, one N. Um, Len and I first encountered this painting. Uh, it was hanging over the fireplace of Ed and Cherry Hunter and Victor. And uh, it was a gift to them from Tom Morrison. I don't know if that name rings a bell with, with any of you. He's the author of Hard Rock Minor, or Hard Rock Gold, rather. And uh, he spent some time uh, mining, I believe, at the Ajax Mine in Victor, which is part of his story in that book, Hard Rock Gold. And he went on to, he's a Camborne graduate, by the way. Um, he went on to some projects in uh, Canada, uh, which are also written up in that book. And he found this painting in, um, in Canada and uh, sent it to Ed and Cherry as a gift and, and a thanks for their hospitality while he was in Victor. And I was smitten with this, uh, this painting, and I think you can see why. And I tracked down Dennis Gagnon. And as it turns out, it's a self-portrait. Uh, Dennis worked... Uh, in the uranium mines, a place called Elliott Lake, Ontario. And this is uh, a self-portrait of a coffee break in one of those uranium mines in Elliott Lake. And in fact, the original of this painting is hanging in the Civic Center building in Elliott Lake. Um, so in any event, uh, next slide. So where is Elliott Lake? Uh, well, I think you can see in general uh, the highlighted red Algoma district in Ontario, north, uh, northeast of Lake Superior and north of Lake Huron. Um, Elliott Lake, uh, if, if you see that as kind of a rough water sea, Elliott Lake, uh, if I had a pointer, I could show you, but I can't. It's in the lower leg of the uh, letter C, down a little farther, Barb. Right about there. Oops, we went past it, but it was right about there. Uh, Manitoulin Island is the largest freshwater island in the world, and it lies off the North Shore of Lake Huron there, and Elliott Lake is not far up in the bush uh, north of the North Shore. Uh, and it's uh, west of Sudbury, I would say 100 to 120 miles, something like that. Next slide, please. Oh, boy, now this, this is one I'm really going to miss the pointer. Uh, Elliott Lake uh, was a, a, a bustling mining community. If, if you look in the lower left-hand corner of this map, you can see the city of Elliott Lake. And it was carved out of the bush in the 1950s to support a dozen major uranium mines. And if you notice those sort of grayish areas scattered around to the uh, upper right and above Elliott Lake, those are actually uh, tailings ponds for some of the dozen um, uranium mines. And you can see some of them marked the Lacknor, the Buckles, the Stan Lee, um, the Quirk, the Panel, the Denison, and so on. It gives you a rough idea of how the, the uranium mines were distributed around the city of Elliott Lake. Next slide, please. These iron mines were, were big, modern, underground operations. They were, uh, depending on where they were, 1,500 feet to 4,000 feet plus underground operations. And uh, when you add that all up with support operations and mills, they employed up to 10,000 people at the peak of operations up there. Next slide, Barb. Uh, this will give you a general idea of what happened up there. The, the primary production was from 56 to 96. Um, the first full year of production was 58, 200 million. The peak was two years later, 10 mines in operation producing 500 million. 
And it's typical of boom and bust economies, one economy or one industry towns. It's up and down. In 1962, the United States canceled all of its uh, contracts for uranium for the strategic stockpiles. And in 95, the death blow came when Ontario Hydro uh, refused to renew their contracts for uh, nuclear fuels. There's still uranium ore up there, but it, uh, the, the supply contracts just dried up. The last mine up there closed in 1996, it was the Rio Algum Stanley mine. And over this, uh, this period of 56 to 96, um, there was a total of 106 million plus tons of ore mined out of these 12 mines up there. Now, you know, uh, let's go to the next slide. When, it, um, when you've got this kind of industry and it's in the bush, you need to provide housing and services for the people that are going to work there. And as I mentioned, there were 10,000 people working in the mines and mills. So they basically carved a modern community out of the bush uh, to support it. And uh, by 1960, there were 25,000 people living there. I mean, there were planned suburbs. There was a modern downtown. Early on, as you can see in the upper left, they had a lot of modular housing uh, when the mines were first being put in. Um, next slide. But 1996, bust, and <laughs> you can see there was some black humor um, associated with that. And I've got an asterisk by the word bust there because Elliott Lake is still there and it has no mines, no operating mines, but uh, they are in the process of reinventing it as a retirement and uh, vacation community. The fishing up there is very good, lots of lakes, the highway connections are good. So it's, it's had some modest success as a retirement and uh, and sportsman's community, but I, you know, having said all this, uh, little did I know that when I first encou encountered the Gagnon painting, uh, painting a tribute to a miner that I liked so much that I'd actually be doing work, professional work for the last big uranium player up there, that I would visit Elliott Lake multiple times, and that Lynn and I would both get the opportunity to go underground at the last operating mine, the Stan Lee, just weeks before it closed. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later if we have time. If not, uh, don't worry about it. But the whole Elliott Lake story is, is much more detailed and colorful than we have for tonight. And I'll give you some links and resources later or maybe put them online if you'd care to dig into it a little deeper. But for now, though, I haven't said much about a persistent prospector or a little man in a big hurry or a big Z. So I'll focus on that part of the story for the remainder of the talk. It's important stuff because it's the very first chapter of this entire story. Let's go to the next slide, Bird. This is Frank Jubin. Uh, he was born to French immigrants in San Francisco in 1911, but he was raised in Canada by a war widowed mother. And he had a, a candidly a very hard scrabble youth in uh, the Vancouver area of British Columbia. But he was a very determined character and uh, he worked his way through college and obtained uh, degrees in both chemistry and geology. He would alternate college with work and when he was working, he was working in the mines of British Columbia and uh, he cut his teeth doing a lot of ge uh, geological field work. Uh, after graduation, he joined Pioneer Gold Mines and he worked all up and down Canada's Pacific Coast evaluating prospects and properties and negotiating options for Pioneer. He gained a, a reputation for being a smart, thorough and honest field worker. And above all, he was a very persistent guy. He, he was like a dog with a bone. After World War II, he moved east and he exchanged uh, places with his counterpart in Pioneer's Toronto offices uh, in, in the financial district of Toronto. And in 1948, Canada opened uranium prospecting to the public in 1948. It had been nationalized prior to that. And like so many others, Jobin got swept up in the enthusiasm for uranium, and he invested $120 in a Geiger counter 
1948, $120 was a pretty big investment, but he was optimistic. But actually, he had pretty poor luck, aside from one very small prospect uh, in northern Ontario. Nothing really seemed to come of it, of it all. But he remained intrigued. Next slide. And he, while he was looking at some gold and copper prospects in the Algoma district that we looked at earlier in 1949, uh, Jumin was uh, approached by a prospector by the name of Carl Gunterman. And Gunterman is pictured on the right in this picture. And Gunterman said he and his grub staker, who was a, Saint, a Sault Ste. Marie uh, hotel proprietor by the name of Amy uh, Breton, and he's the guy, the chunky guy on the, uh, on the left in this picture, had come across a highly radioactive fist-sized rock in the collection at the local mine recorder's office at Sault Ste. Marie. He had no idea where the rock came from. It had a tattered paper tag with it that he, he thought said Lang, L-A-N-G on it. And he thought it might have come from somebody by that name in the Sudbury area. But other than that, he didn't know anything about it. Uh, Jobin badgered him about it every time he passed through the, uh, the Sioux. Uh, the rock definitely made a Geiger counter sing, but they just couldn't figure out where it came from. But uh, Jobin wouldn't let it rest, and he, he kept badgering uh, uh, Gunterman about it. Well, some months later, uh, Breton and Gunterman finally figured it out. The laying on the on the piece of paper with the rock wasn't laying; it was long. And the rock, as it turned out, came from a small uh, pair of of copper gold exploration pits uh, that were dug at the turn of the last century in Long Township, Ontario. Hence the name, the Long Rock. Next uh, slide, please. Well, as Jobin and Breton headed to the site, then it was a geographically favorable place because it was located on the north shore of Lake Huron, just north of Trans Canada Highway, and the uh, and the maybe 500 yards from the uh, Trans Canada or the Canadian National Rail Line. So, I mean, it was in a perfect spot, but it it really didn't look promising geologically. The rocks didn't look at all like the usual vein or pigment type pitch blend deposits and and they didn't look at all like the sandstone siltstone deposits of the Colorado Plateau. So they were mystified. Next slide. What, what they saw was a, a rusty Proterozoic Age quartz cobble conglomerate of a pretty well-known Mississauga formation, locally known as uh, the Matanenda conglomerate. But it, to them, it looked like an unexcited old bed of gravel. But it was highly radioactive. I mean, it was really radioactive. So Jobin had some samples assayed only to be disappointed again. There was very little uranium in the assays. And he thought, well, gee, you know, it's still radioactive. It must be thorium. I, I, it's got to be thorium. But at the time, there was no market for thorium. So he said, I better have it checked for thorium. Well, it came back low in thorium. Too. So he was perplexed, but it just didn't look like it was going anywhere, going anywhere. And being a practical man, he decided to return to Toronto and routine work for a pioneer, or as he put it, I got to put food on the table. Next slide. Well, Schumann worked out of the same Toronto office building as this guy, Joe Hershorn. He was one of the so-called Bay Street Buccaneers, the freewheeling promoters and backers of every kind of mining enterprise that was then traded on the Toronto exchanges. Hershorn was a loud, hard-charging, cigar-chewing Latvian Im immigrant. And uh, like Jobin, he was raised by a widowed mother. At five feet, four inches, he claimed he was built like Napoleon and Nelson and had the same sense of conquest. He made up for a short stature with a larger-than-life presence in any deal-making encounter. As a young man, he worked as an office clerk uh, on Wall Street, and he showed some early investment savvy. He became a broker within three years, and somehow he anticipated and dodged the crash of 1929 and emerged with enough wealth to join the Toronto Exchange only a couple of years later as a trader. 
Uh, financing mining investments and ventures was the kind of crap shooting that really appealed to him and he, and he fared pretty well with them throughout the 30s. While it was inevitable that he and Chobin would cross paths, they worked in the same buildings and in fact, they uh, apparently met for the first time at adjacent urinals in the bathroom. So <laughs> I don't know what you can generalize from that, if anything. They had vastly different personalities, but for some reason they seemed to hit it off. And they worked on several projects and brought a number of mines into production. Uh, in 1949, uh, Hirshhorn was also swept up in the uranium excitement. He told Jobin, I want to get into the uranium business. It's got sex appeal is the way he put it. And the time is right. So they got to work together. And they brought the Ricks mine uh, into production. And that was a small but very rich pitch blend producer in the Beaver Lodge Lake area of Saskatchewan. And in the process, they negotiated the first private supply contract with Canada's nationalized uranium industry in 1951. And that went so well that in June of 1952, Jobin joined Hershorn's technical mining consultants, otherwise known as TMC, full-time, becoming a 10% partner uh, in the business's mining enterprises. Well, shortly after that, uh, Jobin's interest in the Breton Gunterman pits down in, down in the south part of the province was rekindled. He had read of another nearby find that was showing radioactive and uh, radioactivity, and supposedly this one had good uranium assays. So he sent a staff down to inspect and sample the site. Well, <laughs> they telephoned back that the exposure was small and only very weakly radioactive, generally unimpressive, and it looked like another wild goose chase. But uh, Jobin was persistent, and he knew that others had looked at the Breton Gunterman pits that he'd originally looked at since he had been there. So he asked the staffers to check for staking while they were down there, and sure enough, the pits had indeed been staked. Uh, but as it turned out, no assessment work had been done and the claims would lapse in a few days. So Jobin thought, well, why not? So he directed the staff to wait uh, for the claims to lap, lapse and then uh, restake them for TMC, which they did. Well, shortly after that, Jobin had gone on a trip to London. He was seeking funding for an improved mill out at the Ricks mine in Saskatchewan. And while there, he met with Dr. Charles Davidson. And Davidson was at the time a widely respected geologist who would work in South Africa as part of a, a worldwide search for uranium uh, reserves. And they discussed a familiar problem. Davidson had been stumped by highly radioactive tails piles and the waters ran in South Africa that enigmatically showed virtually no uranium in them despite being highly radioactive. And guess what? The ore was a rusty quartz cobble conglomerate. Huh, sounds familiar. But when David said he'd ultimately solved the problem, that's when Jobin's antennas went out. They went way up. And Davidson said that when the uranium was accompanied by iron sulfides, pirates, Near-surface rainwater would decompose the sulfides, become acidic, and leach out the uranium and remove it. Thorium, which was not soluble, was less affected, but the uranium was mobilized and moved out. Well, obviously the light went on, and, and Jobin thought, well, is this the Breton Gunderman problem? Problem is, they'd have to drill to find out. So Jobin called up Hirshhorn. And just before TMC's claims ran out on those pits, Hirshhorn came up with, as he called it, the moolah, 35,000 uh, bucks to do the drilling. So that's good they did. The samples came back in April 1953, and bingo, 50 out of 56 holes were good. Now, the, the Breton um, Gunterman pits were, were nowhere near as rich as the uh, Rick's mine. They were only about his third, a third as rich, but the uh, deposit was much, much larger. And of course, it was right next to the rail tracks. So uh, they immediately started work on it. And Hershorn, who 
for some reason, had a strange fondness for giving projects names starting with the letter P, immediately dubbed the property the Peach. And the Peach ultimately later became the Pronto Mine, the first producer of the district. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Well, the Peach Ore Zone dipped toward the Murray Fault system, which, which Jubin knew as an important mineralized structure with what he called juicy plumbing. And this, this whole concept wasn't lost on Hirshhorn. He said, where did Peachy's Ore come from, Frankie? Where does it go? We got to find out. Well, the Matanenda conglomerate belt seemed to extend roughly east-west along the basement rock contact. But this was really rough bush country and chasing outcrops would be a long, difficult and expensive undertaking. Some ad hoc checking for radioactivity had disclosed only a few teasers here and there. What Jobin really needed was a copy of a, a rare old and out of print geological map of the region that better characterized and located the formations. And this was the so-called Collins Blind River Sheet, which was prepared in 1922 from data from fieldwork conducted between 1914 and 1916. Next slide. Well, it took them some sustained searching, but they came up with two copies of the Collins map, one from a secondhand bookshop in Toronto and the other from stale files uh, in Timmins, Ontario. And what they saw absolutely wowed them. The basal conglomerate contact was not a simple east-west trend, but a gigantic sweeping Z. You can sort of make it out here on this more modern map. And of course, being Canada, it, it, it I guess we should call it the Z, the big Z. And the overall length of this was 90 miles, plus or minus. Well, of course, the enormity of the challenge ahead was both immediately obvious and stunning. Even Hirshhorn was taken back, back by it. But Jobin was confident and very bullish, and he said, well, you know, Joe, you could develop the peach and settle for a million dollars, or we could think big and, and you could maybe make 50 million. Well, as it turned out, it was closer to 700 million, but Jobin was thinking. Hirshhorn, of course, was a gambler and he'd bet. And he sent a few Geiger counter equipped teams deep into the bush up uh, to the north by float plane to spot check the Zed. And within days, they got word back that radioactive conglomerate outcrops were indeed conformed at several target locations. Well, the game was on. Clearly, they'd have to stake as much ground as quickly as possible without attracting the attention of potential co uh, competitors. So they even pulled their drills from the peach site so watchers would think they'd given up. There followed a, a month or so of intense planning and searching for funds sufficient to underwrite a project of this scale, all of which was, of course, kept closely confidential. And that was difficult because of the scale of the logistics and financial issues. They were daunting and unprecedented. And the other thing is that mining licenses that or were at the time, I, I don't know what the law is now, but uh, at the time the licenses issued by the province of Ontario allowed each license holder to stake nine 40 acre claims. And each claim had to be surveyed and staked at the corners. Now, fortunately, the big Z uh, lay over two districts. So each licensee could get nine claims in each district. But even so, it looked like more than 1,000 claims would be needed to be staked to cover the area. And at least 75 trustworthy stakers would be needed. And they'd have to get their licenses here and there at various offices to avoid attracting attention because 75 uh, stakers all getting their licenses at the same time would uh, clearly attract attention. And the, the other factor complicating matters was the requirement that all claims have to be recorded within 30 days of staking. So this entire project was going to have to be conducted start to finish within 30 days. And even more complicating it was that you have to basically record all these claims simultaneously in order to maintain secrecy. So they had to arrange for a team of lawyers to go with the stakers into the bush to prospectively prep and complete all the paperwork 
as the staking progressed. So the whole portfolio of claims would be ready for recording all at once. Um, TMC obviously needed, needed a lot of money and a lot of bodies to pull this off and they needed it all quickly. Next slide, please. Well, Hirshhorn had helped finance the successful Preston East Dome gold mine in the South Porcupine District, some 250 miles northeast of the Big Z, and he remained on its board of directors. He and Frank Jobin decided to take Preston's general manager, Bill Bauk, into their confidence. In this photo, Bill Bauk is the gentleman on the far right. Uh, next to him, to the left, is Frank Jobin. I don't know who the third fellow to the left is, and of course, that's Joe Hirshhorn on the far left. Uh, with Bauk's help and Preston East financial backing, they quickly and quietly assembled a team of stakers, support personnel, bush pilots, lawyers, and pulled together all the tons of equipment that they needed for the effort. All almost almost all of this work being done in the faraway South Porcupine District, so it wouldn't attract attention. And this crew, numbering over a hundred, was to be surreptitiously backdoored into the bush from the north by bush plane rather than from the, the closer, more accessible, but much more visible North Shore of Lake Huron. None of these par uh, participants were told where they were going or where they were when they got there. Next slide. Uh, the campaign started on May 27th of 1953. 1,400 claims covering 56,000 acres were staked substantially in secret by July 9th, and all of the claims were recorded two days later. This effort was absolutely unprecedented in Canadian mining history. Although it was a blitz campaign, the quality of the work was underscored by the total absence of later claim challenges. When the news got out, of course, the rush was on. Within months, the entire region was staked, some 8,000 additional claims. As it turned out, TMC had missed some of the good ones, but nonetheless, their efforts secured most of the key properties. Shorn and Jobin formed a joint venture called Algoma Uranium Group to hold and develop TMC's claims. But a paperwork mix-up, and this is so typical, you'll, you'll encounter this numerous times in mining history, a paperwork mix-up uh, resulted in the entity being chartered as the Algum Uranium Group, but the name Algum was retained. The Pronto mine, the, the old peach, was quickly put into production at the site of the original discovery, and work was started on several other mines closer to what became Elliott Lake. Within two years, Hirshhorn had realized $60 million on the project and Jobin $5 million, all from the big Z. When the Soviet Union exploded its first H-bomb on August 29, 1953, uranium demand soared. Algum sought and obtained a major capital infusion from Rio Tinto to develop eight mines, which ultimately accounted for more than 60% of the Big Z's reserve. And the resulting venture became known as Rio Algum Group. Now, as mentioned earlier, uh, a total of 12 Big Z mines were fully developed within five years, and Elliott Lake became a thriving modern community deep in the bush. And at the end of the day, those 12 mines ultimately generated 30 billion, with a B, uh, dollars of new money. Next slide. Both Hirshhorn and Jobin continued to prosper, both making important philanthropic contributions to the community of Elliott Lake, including bankrolling the construction of a, of a civic center, which they decided wouldn't be named after either of them but for the original Big Z map maker, Collins. And Lynn and I have had the pleasure of eating dinner with the mayor of uh, Elliott Lake in that civic center. Hirshhorn ultimately um, steered away from mining investments and he concentrated more on his collection of 5,600 pieces of paintings and sculptures emphasizing American moderns. Ultimately, he retired to a villa on the French Riviera. Uh, he donated his art collection to the United States and built the Hirshhorn Gallery and Sculpture Garden 
on the National Mall in Washington to house it. And you see that up in the upper right of this slide. And I don't know if any of you have been to that museum, but it is a prominent feature of the National Mall in Washington. Next slide, please. Little Man in a Big Hurry. This uh, biography is by his daughter. I have not read it, um, but I understand it's a good read. And uh, I commend it to any of you that are interested in more detail on this story. I let us look intriguing. Next slide. Uh, Frank Jobin ultimately retired to a gentleman's farm, he called it, northwest of, Ont uh, of Toronto. Uh, but he was a bug on a hot stove. He couldn't sit still. So he continued post-retirement for an additional 20 years as a private consultant on mining projects of various types around the world. And then he ultimately became involved with the UN program to assist developing nations uh, with inventorying their mineral resources. Now he claimed as part of his program with the UN, he found five discoveries of the same magnitude as the big Z. Next slide. Uh, this autobiography of Frank Jobin, Not for Gold Alone, is a heck of a book. I, I have read it and I highly commend it. It's uh, full of interesting tales. Uh, to give you some sense of, uh, of his storytelling, the, the very first chapter or the very first paragraphs of the book um, uh, relay, uh, relate an account of his being shot by muggers in Fresno, California. So the stories go on from there. Next slide. I'll post this to Facebook uh, either later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, it's a YouTube link to a period documentary on both the Big Z and the founding of Elliott Lake. It's well worth watching. It's about 20 minutes. It's classic uh, 1950s, 60s documentary style. Um, and he, wh what's nice about it is, yeah, it has some puffery in it, but it's written for written and produced for a, an audience that is at least somewhat savvy about mining. So it doesn't talk down to you. It, uh, it talks about the mines in a technical sense and it's well worth watching. Um, and I, I'll be glad to post this link. And also one other little surprise, if, if anybody uh, the recognizes the name Stompin' Tom, uh, there will be an extra little uh, uh, perk on what I post on the, uh, on the Facebook. All right, can folks see this? Yes. This is a, uh, a piece of Stan Lee mine ore, uh, which I self-collected in, oh, when was that, 1996, maybe? 96, yeah, it would have had to have been 1996, right. from the 36th level of the Stan Lee mine. It's a piece of the mineralized conglomerate, very heavy, very heavily pyrotized, but it's also fairly heavy in uh, uraninite and branerite, which were the two primary uranium ores. Go back. Well, it isn't. You hear that? You hear the counter clicking? Yep. There it is. That's the stuff. I am done. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Mark. That was good. A little different. And no, Johnny, we didn't retire to Elliott Lake. <laughs> that's that's what I could never figure out, how they were going to get people to retire there. Uh, Pat's uh, cousin had a uh, uh, an old family cottage down at Algoma, and we... Yeah. We went up through Elliott Lake a couple of times, and just uh, an amazing thing to see all the development way up there. You know. Yeah. Well, that, that's just it. Uh, the retirement pitch was that there was a lot of cheap housing there. You could yeah. Have, yes. Could afford, yeah, you could afford or, it. afford to retire there. Yeah. Wanted to fish. You could. There's a lot of fishing. Yeah. Right. You know, it, most of these mines were. Uh, big room and pillar operations. Uh, 
under big lakes, but they were astonishingly dry. The mines were just astonishingly dry because mm -hmm. uh, very tight. We do have the keys to the panel mine. Of course, the mine doesn't exist anymore, but we do have the keys. <laughs> <laughs> when they shut the mine down, they sent me this batch of souvenirs, which is the most incredible, bizarre stuff that they just basically salvaged from the mines. So I have a, a bunch of uh, relics from these mines. I guess you could call them relics. They're not particularly worth anything, but there they are. Interesting. Fine. We've got a bunch of them. Yeah. The, one that, the one that I kind of like, it says, un danger unventilated area. <laughs> I've been tempted to put over certain doors at our house. Uh, is <laughs> <his> man cave. <laughs> <laughs> How did they process the uranium in the mills? Um, it's a good question. It's it's an acid pro it's an acid leach process. Um, if you're interested, John Johnny, I could send you a flow sheet. It's an acid leach process, um, and, and then a flocculation process, which ultimately ends up uh, with yellow cake. Uh, the yellow cake would go through your typical um, uh, dryers, uh, and uh, he scraped off the dryers and put into drums that are a little smaller than 55-gallon drums, and then shipped off for processing. The yellow cake itself is not particularly radioactive. It's uh, only when they process it into uranium fuel pellets that it becomes fairly radioactive. The, the biggest concern in these mines was the quartz cobble. Uh, well, radon, certainly, but uh, mm -hmm. it was a very quartz, quartzy ore body, and as a result, uh, they were concerned about silicosis, and uh, the mine was kept very, very wet. Uh, all the drilling, of course, was wet. All the muck piles were constantly wet down, and uh, there's just a lot of water being sprayed around underground, and and when you consider the vast volume of uh, ventilation air that they blew through these mines, it was actually chilly underground, very damp and, and chilly, wet, wet. and mm. wet. Mm. And the rock was really like a pudding stone. Do you know um, how the mines um, down near Grants, New Mexico, uh, how similar the, is that what they did also down in Grants or? No, the, ge the geology is entirely different. Okay, different, okay. Oh, man, I got a Charlie Horse in my room. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is quartz conglomerate. The, um, the only really similar large-scale deposit that I've heard about was the Witswaters Rand in South Africa. I think there are some other smaller occurrences. It's a paleoplacer. These were old stream beds. Um, basically, the quartz cobbles are, are stream cobbles or river rock. Uh, and uranium, being a heavy mineral, uh, tends to settle to the bottom of these plaster deposits just like gold does. Um, and uh, these, these very ancient rivers were buried, subsequently buried and but underground, they followed river courses, I understand, in these Elliott Lake Mines for as much as seven kilometers. Wow. wow. Interesting. Wow. Any Great any presentation, Mark. That's really a, an interesting place to, uh, to see. And not too many people that I've ever run into have been in the mines like you have. <laughs> No, it, we were lucky. We got lucky. Um, fortunately, it was a very good company to work for, Rio Algum. I, I worked with them on an entirely different project, but obviously they were closing out uh, at Elliott Lake at that time, and uh, their public affairs people were working overtime trying to bring the local community of the new project up to talk with the um, powers that be in Elliott Lake as to what kind of a neighbor Rio Algum was. And, uh, of course, mm -hmm. They got glowing reviews, but didn't help us. It's fun having a lot of these people who've never seen or heard of a mine before going down into the mine. Their reactions were just 
priceless. Yeah, seeing a modern mine, it's not at all what they had in no. in the in their mind's eye. Um, yeah. And the, basically, walking into the offices, you could eat off the floor and. Um, very, very sanitary. Even the dry was spotless. <laughs> I've got one comment to make, Mark. I have to say I've safely I met some years ago Tom Morrison. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that, that doesn't <laughs> surprise me with the Camborne connections. Um, and he, he waltzed into our office. He'd, he's written a, um, a couple of what we would call standard texts it's called Cornwall central mines and they're, they're effectively a, a history of the mines around campbell and Rudruth. and his book is quoted by everybody as being you know the book on the subject and then lo and behold one day he walks into the the mine office and he come to look to meet one of our one of my colleagues who'd been in his year at the school of mines so he come to sort of check him out and while he was there, someone said, well, you've written the book. While you're there, have a look at Keith's mind models. And he was like, and I can just remember, there was a guy in a tweed jacket with what we call corduroy trousers, you know, <laughs> with, you know, leather patches on his elbows and everything like that. And he just stood there and he was gobsmacked. You know, he said, I've never seen anything like it. But, it was oh, like, it, it was, but the stories, the things he'd done and the places he'd been, you know, he was like one of those... You could just sit and listen for hours and hours, you know, of the sort of stuff he'd done. Well, if you haven't read Hard Rock Gold, and, I, and this goes for all of you, you haven't read Hard Rock Gold by Tom Morrison, pick it up. Uh, it, it's, the storytelling is terrific. Cherry Hunter illustrated it. And, and the illustrations in it are by Cherry Hunter, by the way. Okay. Right, I should write that down so I can go looking for it. <laughs> Did actually apply to be professor of mining at Camborne. Ah. But he was up against four academics, you know, who were who were really research based. But I tell you what, they gave talks or presentations on what they were going to do research wise. But Tom gave a talk on all the places that he'd actually been, and I tell you what, it was one hell of a slideshow. Oh, I would think so. <laughs> Mark, did that Gagnon guy do any more um, artwork other than the one that you really liked? He, he did, but they, he, um, I would call that one pseudo-realistic or, or pretty close to realistic. He got off into um, some pretty odd stuff. Um, most, very little of it mining related. I, I can only think of one other mining related painting that he did and it was pretty odd. Um, the rest of it, um, he, he may have been taking psychedelic drugs. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm slandering him here, but um, they're, they're pretty bizarre. Um, that's the only one I really um, got excited about. And I did, I did buy a copy of it from him. Yeah, we still have to get it framed. We've got to get it framed yet. But, <laughs> but, um, One of those small details. <laughs> he's i think he's had some very serious health problems I, and i don't know if they were related to mining or not but um he is basically disabled now <laughs>